And we're live. Welcome to the free play on games, ethics, and war. <coughs> Online festival sponsors, surprise attack. And for a bit of info about free play, we're running all week here in Melbourne, Australia, and we've still got tickets. Gets to our symposium at Acme on Sunday, April 19th. Visit freeplay.net.au for more info. Now, over to you. Hi. Um, welcome, everybody, to the uh, panel on games, ethics, and war. Um, I'm Dr. Malcolm Ryan. I'm a lecturer in game design at Macquarie University, and I'm going to be chairing a panel. Um, we've got uh, four different uh, people with different points of view. I thought maybe I'd get you them to introduce themselves rather than me going through everybody in detail. Um, so starting with Dan. My name's Danny McMahon. I was a writer on L.A. Noir and Horror of the Orient, and I'm now a freelance games writer in Sydney. Again. And Helen? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Helen Berents. I'm a um, a uh, lecturer in policy and governance at the Queensland University of Technology uh, and I got my PhD in international politics and I'm particularly interested in people's everyday experiences of war and in building peace. So that's my connection. You? Uh, hello, uh, I'm Dr Hugh Davies. Uh, I'm senior lecturer and at La Trobe University, Media Arts, Screen and Sound. Um, my PhD was looking at uh, alternate reality games, which is a, a particular interest of mine, particularly as the uh, as they start to become developed for military purposes. And Stephen? Hi, I'm. Dr. Stephen Coleman, I'm Senior Lecturer in Ethics and Leadership at the University of New South Wales, teaching at the Australian Defence Force Academy, so I actually teach the ethics of war to uh, postgraduate students and undergraduate students, particularly to undergraduate students who are going to be officers in the Australian Defence Force. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I thought I'd start by talking about uh, just about our interesting games about war. I mean, the whole there's a whole bunch of different uh, lots of different uh, games that depict war in one way or another. I thought I'd get us each to uh, name what our most our favourite game or the most interesting game we've been playing recently about uh, games and war, or ethics and war. Um, might go in the same order. Dan? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, as a writer, both of video games and in other mediums, I've always been interested in depictions of war in film, in literature, in poetry, and because one of the presences that we should have had really interestingly on this panel was a guy called Corey Davis, the lead designer on uh, a game called Spec Ops The Line, which has been probably one of the most interesting, one of the most progressive, I would suggest, and one of the most discussed voices in the depiction of war in video games in the past few years. And it was really interesting last time we got together to speak to Corey, and I played through Spec Ops The Line, and I think it was a fascinating depiction of the ethical questions of warfare and particularly the conduct of modern warfare but what I found strange was that it posed those questions in these very self-contained very hypothetical sort of vignettes there were these moments of decision these moments of sort of binary decision take one course or take the other and in all other aspects it was actually quite a conventional war game you mowed down a great many nameless and faceless bad guys to achieve your objective now I think the ethical questions it posed were really interesting but as a writer my interest is in the ethics of war but the ethics of war accessed via the depiction of war and the experience of war and I think the way forward in ethical terms is as games mature for us to depict the experience of war in a more mature and more sophisticated and more thoughtful way. And I think there are games that are starting to do that. Yeah, unfortunately, Corey was going to be on the panel tonight, but unfortunately he emailed me this morning and saying that he had to pull out because his uh, company are going into crunch time, as happens to game developers. And sadly, he couldn't be with us. Um, so um, have, perhaps we continue through the list, and then we might talk, go come back and talk about some of the games individually. Uh, so Helen, do you want to 
Yeah, sure. Um, so I was thinking about this when Malcolm posed the question to, to think about a game that um, made us think about the ethics of war. And I have kind of a left field um, game to mention, uh, because it's not necessarily conventionally about war, but a game that um, really makes me think about, and I think that is an important game to, to think about some of these questions we're going to talk about, is actually the game Papers, Please, um, which I played quite a bit um, at various points last year when um, actually doing some work on refugees and migration research. Um, it kind of dovetailed with my academic research. Um, but what I think is interesting about it, and I guess where, where I come into talking about how we think about war, is thinking about the consequences more complexly and the possibilities that games give us to think more broadly about um, the ways in which we we engage with ideas of war and consequences of war and people's experiences of war. So while Papers, Please obviously isn't explicitly about a conflict per se, it's about an um, immigration official at a border checkpoint in a vaguely Eastern European-esque country uh, that has to deal with people coming and um, often without documentation, fleeing various, you know, other kind of criminal elements and a lot of the other kind of complexity that goes on in war that gets erased when we talk about war games only as military shooters per se, which isn't to say we shouldn't talk about military shooters, but I thought I'd throw that curveball into the discussion as well in terms of what we think about when we, we think about war and, and video games. I've just got a note here saying uh, to mention that we will be taking audience questions at the end. And it's, uh, if you tweet on the hashtag FreePlay15, uh, we'll, uh, your questions will get to us and we might share some at the end. Um, thank you, Helen. Uh, Hugh, what's your...? Um, yeah, a uh, couple of things Helen mentioned that was uh, uh, of interest. Uh, I have, I'm not familiar with Papers, Please. It reminds me a little bit of Escape from Woomera, uh, some of what you described, Helen. And, uh, and I, I think something as well, just uh, This War of Mine by 11-bit, which uh, I'm sure will be mentioned uh, several times in this panel, in that it does, it's one of the very rare games uh, that does actually present something other than um, play in war. Uh, it presents um, civilians in war as opposed to soldiers in war, which of course <clears throat> game players are very unused to seeing, but um, the reality of war is, is, is of course um, much more embedded in that situation. My particular interest in uh, where I suppose war and games converge is, uh, is from a historical point of view, war and, and games have always been very connected. But at the moment, I'm quite interested in alternate reality games and how they're being developed uh, by the military as training devices. Uh, and my particular interest is, or I, I suppose my argument, is that alternate reality games differ from uh, multiplayer online games and, uh, and I suppose, computer-based games in that they tend to be combat and action low and are much more invested in um, activities like pattern recognition, coding, strategy, research, knowledge acquisition, planning, and logistics, these sorts of um, activities which I suppose go into, I suppose, data analysis. So people kind of operating at the, the other end of war, um, uh, particularly sort of for, for organisations like the CIA and the NSA. Um, and, and DARPA, who seem to be uh, funding these games. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in how alternate reality games are being developed in that context. Cool. And Stephen? Um, I think there are actually more questions that get raised in some of these unusual contexts in regard to ethics and war. Um, so I've certainly played particularly big strategy games like Civilization, which I started playing with Civilization 1 and Civ 2, 3, 4, etc. Um, and there aren't a lot of ethical questions raised in some respects in games like that just because of the way that they're set up. Um, a lot of the stuff that happens um, in those games does tend to be in somewhat of an ethical void where civilians, if they exist, really only exist on the periphery. Um, 
recently I've played a lot more World of Warcraft and I've realized that there are quite a lot of ethical questions that come up from that because you're interacting with real people in a situation where they don't necessarily need to be involved in, contact, in conflict and they're making a choice for themselves as to whether they're going to be involved in conflict when you're playing on a PvP server. Uh, you can interact with other people in the ordinary world as you're wandering around just doing quests and they can attack you or not if they're um, from the opposing faction. And I think that actually raises a lot of ethical questions for people that they don't even realize that they're, they're having to deal with. So I think um, it's an interesting way of looking at something in a completely different sort of context that the fantasy context doesn't get described a lot when you're talking about war games. People tend to focus on per first person shooters. Um, which I think, again, first-person shooters can have ethical questions there. They can have ethical issues in some respects built into the gameplay. They can have them built into mission objectives, um, but they usually don't. Yeah. Um, now, thinking from my own part, I mean, I'm also um, not much of a first-person shooter player because I don't have the, um, the kind of combat reflexes that you need for those games, but the, the Civilization games I've also played a lot of all of those, and um, it was actually uh, with some of us. <laughs> so for the viewers at home, some of us were actually took part, part in a workshop on this late last year with a wide variety of other people, and uh, one of the speakers there was talking about civilization and, and pointed out the um, how civil encourages genocide, and um, and I thought. Well, about the number of times that I committed genocide in, in civilization, wiping out entire races because they were annoying to me, and um, yeah, so that it, it's quite it's quite confronting for me to now play that game and realize that one of those times when I just go off and wipe another player off the map, that was considered a, a really good a really good move in the game in some cases, but actually, in like world terms, that's a, that's an act of uh, act of genocide. Um, so there's a lot of interesting. I mean, we uh, we tend we do tend to focus on. I mean, I, I don't know. From to me, the first kind of games that came to mind were obviously the um, the first person military shooter games. But I think there are actually a variety of different ways in which war is being depicted in, in our video games at the moment. Um, so I guess to start with, I want to ask the question: Why are we even interested in the question of ethics in games? Why? Um, why can't aren't games just games? Isn't it just just fun? Why should we be raising these questions? Um, and anyone who wants to dive in on that one, I think, who would like to start? Don't all speak at once. For me, I think it's a question once again of you take any subject matter and an uncomplicated and and unnuanced and, and, and a, a, a poorly thought out depiction of that subject matter I think is potentially going to be uh, potentially going to be an amusing game because it's uncomplicated but it's going to be as a writer obviously I would suggest it's going to be a poor narrative experience it's going to be a less fulfilling uh, narrative and a less satisfying story to watch so I think the the uh, worth of depicting uh, the the reason we need to depict war better in video games is as video games become a more and more valid and a more and more powerful storytelling medium, we need to treat our subject uh, areas with the proper respect, and this is a big one of them. Yeah, I mean, for the um, for the blurb for this thing I was talking about, um, I think I mentioned some. You know, in in literature and in film, we have long histories of of great works that that criticise war or which talk about the ethics of being a soldier or um, in various different ways. And yet, we don't seem to have that same. Uh, and they're great movies as well. It's not great movies, great books. They're not like that. Does doesn't take away from their greatness. That actually adds to their greatness. Um, I think think uh, it's unusual that our games are not doing the same. Um, any other thoughts on that? Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think that's um, I think that's true, and I think I think a lot of the problem is is that there's there's a, a really uh, quite a terrible lack of uh, 
I don't know if literacy is the right word, really decisions almost in games. There's there's so little ambiguity in, in uh, you know, the, the great majority. <laughs> when I say that, I mean really sort of, you know, the, the, the 90 to 99% of games uh, that do engage with war um, are this fairly standard, you know, you, you are a, um, a soldier, typically a male, you're running around a, a battle landscape trying to kill other soldiers before they, ki before they kill you. It's, it's a fairly limited set of decisions. Um, and when, when games will sometimes drift outside of that, uh, people will often see them as being uh, sort of like preachy, I suppose. That's weird when we, we think about that in terms of games. We don't think about... Um, media or entertainment that way, uh, such as like books or films or, or even comics, when they have that level of nuance and ambiguity. And, uh, and I mean, yeah, I, I think that games, um, they don't need to be preachy. They just need to sort of contain a modicum of difference and ambiguity. And like, the, the very easy way that we've, we've seen this is um, to, to sort of have civilians um, in that, that war landscape as, as, as either people wandering around that landscape, but more importantly, as, as playable characters, to play as a civilian, mm -hmm. as, for example, this war, war of mine um, uh, uh, puts you in that avatar, I think is a, a lot more interesting. And, and I, I suppose, yeah, it is so much more interesting than grinding through level after level of military combat, uh, which is, you know, kind of mechanical and boring. Um, and encountering some interesting decisions and actually having to make meaningful choices is, in my view, a much more rewarding experience. I think engaging with the ethics of play is um, a much more rewarding experience. I mean, I can see that there are reasons why games often don't do that. Um, if you think of something like, say, uh, uh, person's memoirs. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of a book um, by a, a, a British officer that I met um, about his tour of duty in Afghanistan. You read through his book and very, very little of that book is actually about combat. Uh, it's all about these were the day-to-day -day operations that we were engaged in. This is the sort of thing we were doing. These are the sort of questions that I was having to ask. These were the sorts of problems that my guys were having to deal with as I was leading them through their daily patrols in this area in Afghanistan. But if you converted that book into a game, people would complain about it and say it's boring because nothing's happening. Mm. Um, and you often see in people's descriptions of combat uh, or of their experiences in war, you know, it's 99% boredom and 1% terror. And if you have a game that's 99% boredom and 1% terror, no one's going to want to buy it because they'll be saying, I don't want to go through the 99% of boredom to get to the 1% of action that's in this game. Um, you've got puzzle-solving games that might have um, elements that you know, you're working through these sorts of issues for a long time, and then there might be a little bit of combat involved in them as well, but it's a very different type of game that you're talking about. And basically, I think when people are actually creating war games, they're saying, well, we need to have something that's going to hold people's attention, where they know that there's a lot going on, um, and where they're feeling like they're getting their money's worth out of it. And so I can see that there are some reasons why you don't have so much of the interaction with civilians, for example, um, involved in, in the games that you're creating. But I think there could be a lot more than there is, um, and that anything that doesn't involve civilians running around in a modern combat situation is almost immediately, obviously, unrealistic because civilians in the modern combat sphere are just about everywhere. Yeah. yeah so our games are very heavily uh, sanitized of the experience of war, right? They, uh, we, we quite clearly don't have... We're running around in cities and yet there are completely no citizens or whatever. I mean, uh, Helen, I believe you've written some on that. Would you care to talk about that? Um. Yeah, I can talk about that. I also wanted to um, pick up on something that uh, Stephen was saying just before about that if games were like real war, 90% boredom, small amount of activity, people wouldn't buy them. And I think that's almost something we're overlooking when we all mention the games that we're interested in and when we talk about war is that 
for most people's experience of games are things like Modern Warfare or Halo or like big franchises, America's Army even, if we're talking about explicitly Army and, and game-related stuff. And they're not papers, please, and they're not this war of mine, and they're not the small games that are doing interesting things. So I think there's a question before we get to, you know, what are the interesting games doing about war that says why are people playing these games and what are the messages that are coming out of those games, right? You've got to move someone past that boredom or disengagement if you want them to actually engage, and then it's not entertainment, you know, so there's, there's those questions that get raised. Um, the problem that I have with... Um, some of these games that were being talked about before in this, you said sanitization of games, is the absence of people and, you know, this comes back to, I guess, um, some of these questions of, of people playing games for fun. It's not fun to shoot civilians in a game. Well, I mean, it might be fun, but then you feel like a terrible person, right? Like, uh, and so I guess it comes back to consequences when we talk about ethics. And I was thinking about that when people were naming the games that they were thinking about, was that they were consequential in some way. They make you feel something um, about what is actually happening on the screen. It's, it's something more than just, um, you know, bodies flying, flying around, falling down, whatever they may be doing. Um, so I think that's the... I'm not necessarily advocating that we should put, you know, civilians running around the battlefields of... Um, you know, the next big blockbuster first-person shooter, but I think we need to think about what the absence of them in those is saying about games and is saying about the culture and, and the kinds of people who play them. I think uh, it's interesting, Malcolm, that you said our experience of warfare and games is sanitised. I, I would suggest our experience of warfare and games is actually a distilled version of warfare, which is purely, as Stephen said, the memoirs of those who you know, who served in armed conflict is that they spend very little of their time actually in combat. What we have in games is just the experience of combat for hours and hours and hours and, you know, rounds and rounds and rounds and enemies and enemies and enemies. And, uh, Helen, you were saying that uh, it's these, these, these choices and these moments of consequence. I would suggest that those choices and moments of consequence are distilled as well. In Spec Ops, certainly, you have moments of, you know, pure moments of save the, you know, save the civilian, shoot the civilian, as simple as that. I think games like, uh, we are going to greatly improve our depictions of warfare when those choices and those consequences become more nuanced and more, more, you know, diluted with all of the difficulties, legal and moral and logistical, that that encumber warfare. Games like Papers, Please and This War of Mine, I think, are remarkable because they are nuanced. In This War of Mine, you don't always know what consequences your choices will have, but you have to make a very difficult choice regardless. Um, yes, in terms of the, um, the consequences, uh, I thought uh, Spec Ops was interesting because it does uh, show you the... Uh, um, Shrek Ops does show you the the people that you I mean in the particular in the the white phosphorus uh, scene in Spec Ops you do then get to see the people that you've just been shooting and, and some of them are civilians and they're actually suffering rather than I mean one of the one of the things we do sanitize is definitely death in war even in the goriest of games when you shoot somebody they they're just dead they don't lie there wounded dying for you know, longer periods of time. Um, but Spec Ops actually broke that and, and did show you people suffering as a result of your actions. So how did you find that as a player? Um, Dan or anybody else who's played that? I think it's uh, it's interesting. It, it uh, You are right in that it attempted to depict the non-sanitized version of warfare and I think it was effective. It was certainly a powerful moment in the context of that narrative but I can't help but feel I'll suggest anyway, and people people can discuss this, I can't help but feel that violence and the physical, visceral consequences of violence, I can't help but feel that that is not the route to take. Because I think we've seen a lot of that. Certainly we see uh, gore and violence in video games 
all the time, and I think Mortal Kombat came out today, right, where at, we're at the, uh, the point of pushing violence and gore in video games about as far as we can, and it doesn't seem able to shock anybody. Mm. So I think uh, other depict depictions of, of, of other aspects of warfare, things that make you, you know, uh, an attempt to make players think rather than revolting them, I think is probably a far better tool for getting people to engage with those difficult choices. So what do you think, um, in, so what ethical questions could we be raising about war? What would you like to see in a game? Uh, Stephen, perhaps? Well, I mean, it, it depends on the type of game. Uh, when we talk about the ethics of war, there are two distinct aspects that we, we talk about. We talk about the ethics of going to war in the first place, whether a particular war is justified, and we talk about ethics within war, uh, and actions that soldiers take, uh, that leaders take within the context of a particular conflict. So if you're talking about something like a, game, a big strategy game like Civilization, then it, realistically you're probably talking about decisions about going to war in the first place. And some of those things are sort of tied into the gameplay um, in versions of, of strategy games like that. So if you go to war for trivial reasons, then um, the AI remembers that and people don't like you very much and it becomes harder to actually construct uh, alliances. It makes it harder to trade with other, um, with other civilizations and so on because they remember and you get a bad reputation from what you've done in the past, whereas if you go to war for justified reasons, um, then they, they take that into account and they think, well, this is not such a bad person, we can deal with them in the future. So some of those sorts of things get tied in a little bit in these big strategy games. Um, when you're talking about decisions made on the battlefield, these sort of justice within war decisions, um, it's mainly about discrimination and proportionality, so discrimination, you know, attacking combatants and military targets and not attacking those that are not military targets and not attacking civilians, and proportionality about how much damage that you actually do. Um, and I was thinking about it while we were talking um, on this panel about how difficult it actually is to really make people think about issues of discrimination. Yeah. If you've got civilians running around on the battlefield, if you're an actual soldier on a battlefield and you shoot a civilian, you know that you shot a civilian and it has a rea you have a reaction to that. You know that you've actually taken an innocent life if you've killed this civilian on the battlefield. But how do you put that into a game? How do you make the player, say in a first-person shooter, think, well, shooting civilians is bad? All you can really do is, is put it into a score sheet or something and say, well, you shot this number of civilians, therefore you lose this number of points, therefore um, either you fail the mission or um, you know, the, the opposition side gets more points and so on and your team lost this, this conflict because you shot too many civilians and so on. Um, it's certainly a very different sort of thing than you're talking about if you're an actual um, soldier on the battlefield who knows that you've killed an innocent person. I don't know exactly how you put that in to, um, into gameplay. Um, if you put it into gameplay, then it's going to be a rather different sort of thing because it doesn't have that instant reaction for you and that moral guilt that you have for, I've done this terrible thing. I think, I think um, just, to, just to, to butt in, I think a way of looking at that as well might not be... To, uh, or reframing it, not how to um, think about these things differently, how to portray death differently in games, but to think about how games already betray, uh, portray death. And in pretty much any first-person shooter, of course, you know, as, as soon as anyone dies, they just sort of quietly evaporate and then uh, respawn somewhere else. And, of course, this doesn't happen in reality. So this is the standard language of death in a game, is that you, uh, usually in under 10 seconds, uh, you, you disappear and then you restart. And of course, you know, this, this com completely conflicts with um, our idea of life and death. Uh, it would be an interesting, I don't know, kind of activist hack, for example, if uh, someone created a game, uh, a, like a little plug-in for a, 
uh, multiplayer online game where the bodies just piled up for a 24-hour period, for example, and it got to the point where you could no longer move in the game or simply just dead versions of yourself as well as everybody else. And even just that thing of looking at looking down at your own dead body. And, um, I mean, something like this, it must be very easy to do because it would... Uh, I mean, I, I don't know the mechanics of it, but um, I guess the fact that we're locked into this um, way of seeing the game world um, yeah, I think if we if we just do that thing, we would actually sort of think, well, hang on, how does the real world work? You know, we're not putting in civilians, and we're completely getting rid of all of the materiality of, of death, all of the bodies, all of the blood, all of this. If we if we kept that in there and left it in there, wouldn't that be a much more interesting um, way of provoking uh, an ethics around games? Hmm. And conversely, I'm sorry, Hugh. I wonder if you take away the concept of the player's death, if you make the player entirely immune to bullets, I suspect that people, you know, in my own experience, you tire of killing bad guys very quickly if there's absolutely no threat to yourself either. Yep. Hmm. I mean, the other way you can go with something like that, of course, is very, very uncommon, but happens sometimes, where death becomes final, and you lose everything and have to start from the very, very beginning again. People don't tend to like that, but it is a way that you can go, and it makes you think more seriously about your own death in the game. Yeah. Um, so one game that I played for a long time, NetHack, you're, uh, it, it's you know probably 30 years old now, um, but if you die in that game, you lose everything. So if you've gone all the way to virtually the end of the game and you die, well, you have to start from square one again. Yeah. Uh, it certainly makes you think more differently about what you're doing in the game and... and your own death in the game. Maybe there's ways of incorporating that sort of thing in so that other actions that you take have a more serious effect in the longer term, and particularly if you're involved in you know, in war crimes and deliberate killings of civilians, that it has some effect on you. Um, I don't know. I'm not a designer, so I can only make suggestions and sort of say, hey, are there ways of doing this? Um, I think Spec Ops the line from, I haven't played it, but I know people who have, and uh, uh, certainly, some of my friends who've played it have said, you know, I, I, you know, the white phosphorus scene, I had to stop playing for days because I just kept thinking about it. So it probably did bring the moral guilt in, in that sort of situation where. It, but it, I think perhaps in some respects that was just because it was so different and so shocking. And whether you can keep doing that is another matter. I wanted to to pick up on. Um Stephen's starting point for this, you know, how do we talk about why? Well, how do we talk about ethics? What ethics should we be talking about? Where we talk about why we go to war, and then also the the player, well, the the soldier in war, and the other thing that about games when we're talking about if we're talking about that broader question is whose wars are games depicting, right? So, kind of who who are we playing as? Who are we fighting for? What is the end goal? Um, you know, and this idea that it's the West against the rest, whoever the, the current bad guy is in broader geopolitical issues get reflected in video games, um, you know, and the really basic ideas of military inter uh, entertainment complex, but more subtle, you know, relationships between culture and politics and militarization in various ways and how the games that we play reflect certain... Um, broader ethical questions about how we see and engage the world when we go to war outside of games as well as when we go to war in games. Just wanted to kind of throw that out as a another thing to think about. And then the other question of, you know, on the on the same tangent of the people you play in the games, the soldiers, who are they, right? They're most often white American, you know, well-trained, well-built men. And so we're representing a very particular view there when we talk about the, the ethics of, of playing those games as well. So there's kind of two things that people can respond to if they want, or we can move on. <laughs> I can't remember which game it was, but I know that a few years ago there was a huge outcry about a particular game that allowed you to play from the other side where you turned out to be a terrorist and you were actually shooting American personnel. Um, Someone else who's more acquainted with these sorts of things can probably remind me what game it was. Well, there's the No Russians level of um, modern warfare, um, modern warfare, right? That caused a lot of 
a lot of outcry because you were shooting civilians as well. Like that's the other thing, right? You're not shooting soldiers. Mm. So. Um, yeah. The other question about the spec op scene, the white phosphorus scene, and maybe why it's so powerful is it's not only it doesn't only force you to walk through civilians, but it forces you to walk past women and children that have been killed. So again, gendered kind of representations of war and, and the value of life as we engage with it in games as well. Throw my feminist hat in the ring there. <laughs> um, so do you think the game, I mean, <clears throat> sorry, uh, do you think that games, like, inherently, so, I mean, Stephen raised the point of, um, you know, as, as soon as it becomes a score on, you know, that your team shot more civilians than the other team, therefore you lose. Do you think games inherently sort of instrumentalize things and take away the actual ethical personal blend, dimension because it just becomes about optimizing your score? Or are there ways of, of getting around that feeling of just trying to play efficiently rather than play... Mean, uh, ethically engage with what you're doing? Well, some people don't care about their score. <laughs> you know, I've certainly seen people going in through, uh, through games where it's sort of, well, you know that you're going to fail this particular mission if you kill too many civilians, but they just go through killing everything because, hey, I just want to have some fun today. Um, and I know I'm going to fail the mission, but it doesn't matter. That's probably not a solution to the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not a solution to the problem. Is it about the goals that you set the player in the context? Like, I'm not a game designer, but if the goal is to kill all the enemies, then that's going to prompt certain actions in the player. You know, if the game is to get through a space with most of your team alive or, you know, unnoticed, which I know, you know, stealth games, etc., etc. You know, if you set different kinds of, of objectives... How many civilians can you usher to, to safety, you know, whatever? Can you protect the food convoy to reach the refugee camp? Whatever the, the, the goal is, if it's not a direct combat-related goal, maybe that challenges players to think about. I think uh, yeah. all of these scenes that we're talking about and all of these hypotheticals that we're... all these hypotheticals that we're postulating and also all of the notable scenes that we're referencing, like the white phosphorus scene, but even people's experience in civilization and in paper, Papers, Please, they're not based... I would suggest that they're not based purely on gameplay. They are, all of them, based on na uh, gameplay married with narrative. Yep. And I think the, the experience of... You know, the experience of... The, the, the only reason Spec Ops managed to ask the ethical questions that it did is because there's no scoring in it. To what... Right. To the best of my recollection, there is no score. There is no, you know, there is no uh, concept of competition. It's the player's path through a narrative. That white phosphorus scene is powerful because it is the experience of of your player character, Captain Walker, and his his. It's 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 his reaction to his uh, mistake and to his uh, he is is committing that atrocity. And I think even you know Helen, even those even those situations that you were just uh, suggesting, protect the convoy, all of these sort of things, they are uh, narrative focused. I think in in pure in pure gameplay terms, that's where we that's where we start to hit all of the problems with depicting warfare. That's where the depiction of war and and the depiction of violence starts to be devalued is in gameplay, where it gains its pathos and where it gains its power and its ethical considerations is in narrative. So perhaps it is only a particular kind of game that can properly interrogate the subject matter of warfare. Papers, Please is a really excellent example because it is very systematized and almost very arcade in its gameplay, but it builds its arcade gameplay out of little narratives. And Papers, Please is interesting, I think, because... It, the, it plays the narrative off against the gameplay. The gameplay is actually encouraging you to dehumanize these people and just play, just stamp their passports as efficiently as possible. Sure. At the same time, they're presenting, they keep interrupting you with their little stories. Mm. And all you want to do is stamp everything as quickly as you can, and they tell you some little sob story, and you're actually, uh, for me, it was actually like 
I kind of wish they just shut up and let me do my job. But they kept. Oh, see, I got really stressed about it. I wanted to help them all. <laughs> yeah, well, I wanted to help them, but I wish I didn't want to want to help them. So I wish they'd just shut up and I could ignore them. But as soon as they said which something, which in itself, I, sorry, which in itself becomes uh, contributes to the narrative of the player character in that game. Yeah. Well, there's an appeal to the an player narrative in that game. There's an appeal to the humanity of the player. Right? I think that's why it's compelling. I think that's why this war of mine's compelling as well because it's saying here are people trying to do everyday things. It's not, you know, here's Macho Man with his with his giant cannon gun, you know, shooting down shooting down faceless Arabs or whatever it might be. Like it's appealing to a different aspect of you. Mm-hmm. And I'm not necessarily sure that all games you need to resolve, you know, they need to have some deep ethical meaning because, you know, I like watching rom-coms as much as I like watching foreign language films, you know, and I get different things out of them. So maybe it's more about a maturation of the medium where we can have games that are, that prompt thinking and we can have games that are, I really don't want to say, like, for fun, (laughs) you know, like... um, Maybe if it wasn't fun, it wouldn't be called a game. Different <laughs> objectives. Um, I think that that uh, that comment you just made then, uh, Stephen, though, whether it would be called a game, um, I don't quite know how to say this. Uh, just sort of trying to find the words, but um, the way in which I guess one criticism that has been launched at the idea of, I mean. If, if, several times the idea of having uh, uh, women avatars in um, uh, war games has come up and, and, and people say, oh, it's not realistic. It's not realistic to have women in these combat environments. And, um, um, and it just, it's, it's a really powerful comment from the point of view of that you realise people who are playing these games are mistaking them for reality and that they are sort of thinking that war is uh, what is, is the game place that they're playing or that, that, you know, the war landscape is sort of a lot more akin to some sort of uh, World War I trench warfare with rows of men lining up against each other or something like this, and it's not sort of uh, house-to-house urban landscapes or bombings on cities or, you know, sort of rape and terror and all of these things that we know are involved with war and we know that uh, um, women and children are also very much a part of. I mean, you you watch the news and then you read comments like that and you you recognise that that people um, do take these representations of war as real in games. And I think that um, this, for me, is a really important thing, is that that because games and... um, War games are quite often demonised for you know their, their sort of ethical uh, or, or just sort of this like broad picture of ethics, but typically it's the games and the play aspect of it which is demonised, and not the representation aspect of it. And of course, you know the majority of military games uh, present war and represent war as um, as a playing field. Of course, it's it's a board game. It's it's com and combat is play. But I think this, for me, is a really big problem because we shouldn't mistake this as a corruption of play. Too often people valorise play. They misperceive it as an inherently benign or even outright sort of good activity uh, like associated with sport and musical instruments and, and, and typically childhood. But we should remember that acts such as military combat, physical violence and torture and, and bullying all, re- all sort of rely on the subversive inventiveness inherent in play. Um, and that, um, yeah, just play is an exploration of it and, um, and an exploitation of possibilities within the confines of a rule-based system. But the representation environment that we couch that play in, um, I think, is the real danger here. Play can be a lot of different things, but it's the representation of war, I think, in games which is super troubling. Hmm. Well, I mean, uh, we certainly sorry. know that video game companies spend a lot of time trying to make other aspects of the game as realistic as possible. So they'll have consultants that are talking to them about you know, the particular armaments they're using, these tanks, these guns, how these things work, what they look like, you know, what destruction they would cause to a building and so on. And so they're making all of the physical aspects of 
of the military hardware as realistic as possible. And in, in this but way... Then, it's, then it all falls down when you're talking about the environment in which they're fighting where, well, it's only you know good guys and bad guys and we can clearly tell them apart. Yeah, I, I totally agree. There's this this um, like forensic um, obsession with weapons and armor, and uh, and and you know, of course, a lot of this is tied up with micropayments as well. But um, but then the, the sort of visceral realities of war uh, are, as I was saying before, you know, people people just sort of evaporate; they disappear. And this is, of course, you know, the key aspect of what war is. And it completely falls away from representation, and war becomes uh, a, fetish, a fetishization of military armaments and um, and that sort of thing. I think um, fetishization is is a really important point in terms of how we deal with with thinking about games, right? This idea of, in some ways, glamorizing it. We talk about the military hardware and we talk about how big my gun is and, and all those kind of things. Um, and we don't talk about the, the, uh, other, the, the more complex context. Um, and the other, the other issue that we haven't really talked about at all, and I know we're going to run out of time, is that, um, is that these games say the only way to play, the only way to address these conflicts you find yourself in is through military response, is through violence. It doesn't present any other kind of kind of discussion. So if we're talking about ethics of, of conflict, we're missing a whole layer where we talk about diplomatic and negotiated solutions, where we talk about walking away from battlefields, where we talk about challenging people's actions in various ways like that games say the solution is have the bigger gun and kill the other guy faster. And so I think there's like a fundamental fundamental kind of ethical question at the heart of that as well. I was having a discussion with some friends just today about whether or not you could make a, a game based on non-violence. So not just a game that isn't violent, but a game in which you are using the methods of non-violence to solve a problem rather than, rather than violence. Or a game in which you had the choice between violent and non-violent means, and you uh, you play it out. Whether you could do that in a way that was still an engaging game experience. Um, Sim Gandhi. Not... Yeah, Sim Gandhi. Sim Gandhi, I'd play that. Let's make it. <laughs> or, or Peacemaker as well, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are games that sort of encourage you to think differently about how you're going to carry out particular um, particular missions. Um, and where the gameplay becomes more complicated and, and chaotic the more you kill people. And I was thinking about the possibilities perhaps of having something like, well, you're, it is Peacemaker but in a different way. You know, Go in and, and supervise the reconstruction of Baghdad in 2004, for example, where the gameplay is set up so that the more you use violence, the more violence there is likely to occur. Um, the more civilians you kill, the more the civilian population turns against you. The more internal violence there is, the more chaotic it becomes and the harder it is to actually achieve the objective of, I don't know, creating a, a stable society here at the end. And it would encourage you to try different ways of going about it and actually explore, well, can we do this without using violence at all? Well, probably not because there is violence inherent in the situation but it's going to have to be really controlled violence. We're going to have to be really careful about what we do. We're going to have to be really careful about who we shoot at, who, ne who we negotiate with, who we don't negotiate with, and so on. And I think you could get some really, really interesting gameplay out of something like that. And it would have to be that, well, the more violence you use, the more indiscriminate violence you use, the less likely you are to actually achieve a successful outcome at the end. So Peacemaker is actually, I mean, I don't know if it was what you're referring to here, but there is a game, Peacemaker, which is about the um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict in which you... That's the one I was thinking of, yeah. yeah. Do you want to say something about that? Um, oh, it's been a while since I engaged, you know. I know that, uh, I can't remember his, his name, Ari... Um, uh, I, I can't remember, but basically what, what the game is, it's a very interesting game in that it... Um, drags in real-time information on the conflict between uh, Israel and Palestine. And, uh, as a player, you have to um, essentially negotiate between the two sides as that uh, conflict evolves in real-time. 
-hmm. So I think it was invented, I'm going to say, about 10 years ago. And essentially, it's just it, it drags in feed from um, I think it's the uh, newspaper Haaretz and the, the Jerusalem Post and a few and a few other publications, maybe the, the New York Times, Washington Post, and um, and it it just sort of I guess data scrapes all of the information um, related to that particular uh, conflict and. As a player, you need to try and moment to moment solve the issues as they arise. You, you sort of wow. work as a diplomat. That would be very challenging. Yes. Yeah. But I think it, I mean you know it's um, uh, it's it's terrible. I can't remember his his name now. But but Ari, who was one of the the co-developers, is uh, now very much involved in games for change in. Um, in the states, and I think that uh, I think that was one of the one of the very good um, examples of a, of a, of a, of a, a serious game for change. Um, with regard to time, um, I was actually told that because uh, we're the last one on, we can go for as long as we want. Um, <laughs> but uh, maybe we all actually want to go home and go to bed. At least I want to go home, or maybe just me are already home. Um, but I do have a question from uh, from a uh, uh, from, the, from Twitter. Um, uh, how are games contributing to aiding, perpetuating uh, uh, real war? Um, so what do you see as, I mean, certainly I mean, it puts me in mind of um, the collateral murder video that came, the WikiLeaks released from, um, from Iraq of the soldiers uh, shooting civilians like, on, a, on a virtually a video game kind of like screen and laughing about uh, treating it like it was a game. Um, any thoughts on, on that? Somebody's echoing really bad. Uh, look, I mean, from my, my point of view, I, I think I've sort of already got my high horse about that a little bit. Uh, I really see an issue in the representation of war in games, and of course that has bled back into the representation of war in war itself, um, whereby, um, uh, you know, pe people are um, quite often... <clears throat> uh, say shooting and killing people on the ground in Iraq, and they're kind of they have nine till five jobs, and in in places like Arizona, and uh, and they're sort of you know several pieces of uh, military hardware away from uh, the people who they're killing. You know they're, they're they're pressing buttons on the other side of the world, uh, which are connected to gunships, which hovering sort of you know half a kilometre uh, in the air above um, Iraq. I mean, you know, this is particularly what the... Um, um, th this is, I suppose, very much what um, uh, spurred uh, Chelsea Manning into to releasing the documents that, that she did. Uh, it was, it was the, the recognition of that representation of war. I think that I'm, I'm glad we didn't get to the end of the panel without talking about drones because I think that's something that we have to have to talk about in in the context of um, you know questions of ethics and war and, and virtual representations of war right um, and without you know going into simpler simpler simplified you know narratives where um, drone drone controls feel like a PlayStation control or whatever, which you know yeah. doesn't really talk about the complexity of what's going on at all. But I think there's something really worth talking about there about how we how we think about and represent um, war and how it's been represented, and then broader and you know to come out as both a feminist and a lefty uh, to talk about the 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 amount of money that is invested in. The, the games industry in certain games by military companies, by governments even at various points and whose interests are being represented in those games. I'm obviously not talking about games like Papers, Please and This War of Mine. You know, I'm talking about those games that sanitize and glorify and fetishize war in various ways. And I think they have a really, a very real consequence in the real world as well. Yeah, it's it's interesting that you mentioned you know how drone controls feel like playing a video game. But we, I know that with some of the local um, pieces of hardware that they're using, um, the the drones that are controlled by people on the battlefield for um, surveillance purposes and so on, they are actually literally using Xbox and PlayStation controllers for them because people are familiar with these things. 
So when they're flying, you know, micro drones on the battlefield to get a, a feel of where the enemy is, the controllers that they're using are literally based on Xbox or, P or PlayStation controllers because this is what people are used to using. Well, I mean, you know, this is this is just the, the um, what's called in the academy is the military um, industry. Um, um, entertainment. Yeah, military entertainment. Um, well, process basically. It's it's, it's all the connections, uh, the whole industry connections, um, that tie uh, military and and games entertainment together. And of course, you know the the um, the game, uh, the games industry, and the military hardware industry have got very strong vested interests in the two being very closely tied. And so, you know, when people talk about this um, uh, this industrial complex, it, it sounds a little bit like a uh, sort of conspiracy theory, but of course, it's not at all. It's um, it's it's very well mapped connections, as as you've just pointed out. Sam. It's very public as well. I mean, America's yeah. army is clearly, um, I mean, where's it's it's. Connections to the military and its leave, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's a, it's a recruitment tool. I think the the other thing to to mention when we're talking about how do games contribute to perpetuating real warfare is the fact that for most of us, I don't want to speak for everyone or everyone listening, but for most of us, we don't live in a war zone. We haven't experienced war. We haven't fled war, so we can play these games with some sense of distance. Um, this was really brought home to me. I did my PhD field work working with uh, young people that had been internally displaced by Colombia's armed conflict and I spent three months hanging out with them and doing narrative based research and they're telling me stories of running away in the night of lying under their bed because the gangs were fighting in the street with their guns again. <clears throat> and even though I didn't experience any of that directly myself, um, when I came home my partner was playing um, shooting games in the lounge room and I couldn't listen to them you know for several months before I got over that because they just reminded me I could just hear these young people telling me their stories in their head and so I think there's another aspect of this which is a distance when we can engage and how we engage with war that these questions are somehow less not meaningful but less impactful on our everyday life we can play them as a game and put them down and that raises questions about how we think about war in the real world and war on our screens as well just, um, and, sorry, I, I agree with everything that's been said, but just very briefly in answer to the question, I would suggest that I'm not sure about perpetuating warfare, but I believe that war games are going to continue to be made, I think, for political reasons, for the reasons of the military entertainment complex and everything that you're saying. I think they are going to continue to be made in the same, because warfare and conflict is one of the extremes of the human experience, and that's what you make art about and what I take great uh, comfort from is that uh, and what I really believe is that as video games mature as an art medium I think you will see in them and we're already seeing in them the movement that you see in all other artistic mediums in literature in in painting in film in in poetry you will see this movement towards a much more mature we've talked about the maturation of the medium, a much more mature and a much more thoughtful uh, depiction of warfare which starts to take in all of these, not only the experience, the visceral experience of warfare, but all of these questions of politics and and uh, morality and ethics that we're raising here. I think that's probably a good piece to wrap up on. Uh, thank you everybody for coming along. Thank you to all our listeners at home. Um, and yeah, um, have a good free play. And, uh, I don't know. How do we end? How do we end? What do we want to say? War is bad.